Hello, everyone, and welcome to North Carolina. Actually, I got my PhD just up the street uh, at Chapel Hill, and we always used to have this basketball rivalry with UNCC and, and UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, but delighted to be here to talk about where can interfaces uh, take us next. It's just going to take me a minute before this uh, warms up. Excellent. We'll take a second. All right. Um, we live in a very confusing world, you know. Um, the largest uh, taxi services company doesn't own any taxis. And the largest hospitality company in terms of market cap doesn't own any hotels. The largest media company doesn't own any media. And as we think about the next billions of people who are becoming newly digital, the solutions for them are also going to be very unique. So for me, what's exciting to see how this community um, at West can think about solving problems for the next billions who are looking for not just solutions in white collar jobs or in their offices, but in many areas, in health, in education, in transport, in agriculture, in food, in hospitality, in, and even for daily wages and farmers and agriculture. And a lot of these areas uh, were considered kind of separated from the computing world uh, because we didn't have a digital interface. And uh, some of you might think that, hey, the upcoming solutions are just a bunch of apps you know, built in, in San Francisco. But instead of apps, uh, let's think about dApps, digital applications for physical services, or DOPS if you want to make it broader, digital opportunities for physical services. And with these DOPS and DAPs, now we have an opportunity in this community to really go impact the physical world in areas where simply we couldn't do it before. Excellent. Now, and, and this transformation this newly digital lifestyle that we all have is creating some hilarious situations. So I was just returning my rental car after Siddharth in Anaheim, and I noticed this sign uh, at, uh, at Avis counter. And if you look at the top right, it says, have you forgotten your tapes and CDs? And when's the last time you carried tapes and CDs? And I chuckled, and then I started looking at other parts of this, uh, of this poster. It says, what are some other things that could disappear over the next few years? Which one, which one is next that's going to disappear, you think? The camera has almost disappeared, right? Uh, what's, what's next? The wallet is almost gone. Uh, keys, there is nothing special about keys. We should be able to replace that very soon. Um, what about the glasses? We could potentially put in prescription directly into our displays. Um, but maybe the cell phone itself will disappear with wearables and embeddables and digestibles. <clears throat> so when we look at these solutions, I think it's clear that our interface to the digital world is going to be unique. So let's talk about the eye conditions uh, to start with. You know, here I am uh, getting an eye test uh, for cataracts. Uh, you know, a device that really hasn't changed for the last 30 years. Um, and the interface is the same. Uh, to get a retinal scan, this is a quarter million dollar device to look at the back of your eye. Uh, but check out the user interface. You know, the nurse is going to shove my head hope, you know, hard enough so that she'll get a good picture. But the best part is if she, she takes a picture, if she does not get a good picture, you know what she does? 
she's going to use my head as her mouse. Uh, and to get prescription for eyeglasses lost in a foropter. Now, it's kind of funny how horrible interfaces are, 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 these are, uh, but at the same time, there are billions out there who need these services but don't get them because of lack of goodies interfaces. So it's clearly, it's clear that when we talk about the intersection of this emerging interfaces and emerging worlds, we cannot think linearly and we cannot just scale the way we have been scaling. So my group did some work uh, about five years ago um, with a device called iNetra, which is a snap-on eyepiece that goes on top of a phone. You look through it, click on a few buttons. Uh, when you're done, you align some lines, it gives you a prescription for your eyeglasses. And your nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism, and can also scan for your cataract, which is cloudiness uh, in your lens. Now, the traditional solution for this involves uh, shining lasers into your eye and using extremely high quality and highly sensitive uh, image sensors. But you know, we have something magical in our pocket. When you have screens that have 300 plus dots per inch, uh, they started calling them retina display, but they probably didn't realize that we can actually use the retina display to measure the eye itself. Now, a traditional device, as I said, is called shock heart one wavefront sensor. It shines a laser spot at the back of the eye. Is there a laser pointer here? I'm going to shine it at the back of your eye. Um, if anybody has one? All right. Um, digital interface. You don't care about physical, inter uh, physical devices. And uh, the beacon that's created at the back of your eye um, you know, um, emits light, emits wavefronts. Um, and then the sensor in this traditional uh, autorefractors, as they call them, um, has an array of micro lenses. Thank you, Aaron. I'm not on the Panthers team. <laughs> um, uh, at, the, at the back of the eye, it creates this energy front, and then you have this micro lens arrays. If all the rays coming out of uh, the lens are parallel, because you know, this is exactly one focal length, you would see these nice spots at the center of each of the micro lens. And that's when you have a normal eye. If you have nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, then uh, those rays will not be parallel, and you see small displacement under each of these micro lenses. So on your image sensor, any displacement of these dots um, you know, indicates a, a, a change in wavefront. And then you can just do, uh, you know, integrate the local slope, just 2D Ponsai integration to recover the, the aberration in your eye. So this is a great solution, has been around for about 30 years. How can we replace lasers and sensors with human interface? So here's an idea. Uh, you take the cell phone display, same micro lenses, just the inverse of what you just saw. Um, and if you show the dots at the center of these micro lenses and you have a normal eye, you'll see a nice spot. So again, on the screen, this uniform array of dots, you'll see, you'll perceive a single dot. But if you have an aberrated eye, then the same dots at the center of the, uh, shown at, as uniform grid, will actually create a jumble of dots, right? So using the interface on the screen, you can simply displace those dots intentionally so that the rays are pre-distorted, and then you would get a single dot. Okay? So this is a trick that you can use to displace these 25 dots, which is 50 degrees of freedom, to measure your refractive error. Now, of course, it's going to be an annoying interface if you have to do 50 degrees of freedom to compute just three values, your spherical error, your cylindrical error, and your axis. So again, you can create a, a novel interface that allows you to navigate through this 50-dimensional space, but only quickly reach those three parameters that you care about. So again, we have solved a complicated optics and sensing problem into an interface problem, right? The snap-on eyepiece costs next to nothing. It's plastic lenses and some prisms, and all the intelligence is in the interface and the software. And, and this is kind of a thermometer for your eye, because you know, children don't go to school, 
because they don't see very well. There are 2 billion people worldwide uh, who need to wear glasses but don't wear them. Um, and there are labor who cannot do their job um, because they are not able to function. Um, so it's not just a problem of removing you know, blurred vision, uh, but some huge socioeconomic problems. Uh, and sometimes you just want to watch you know, Ronald Lino kick that goal uh, in high definition. So we spun this out uh, as, a, as a venture, um, and we're looking at all kinds of uh, various uh, clever solutions for interface uh, that can allow us to dramatically simplify and reduce the cost of complicated solutions. And more recently, we started tackling uh, an even bigger challenge, which is taking the picture of the back of the eye. Remember the mouse, my head as a mouse? Well, what if we change the problem? The biggest ch challenge in looking at the back of your eye, retina, is not the imaging, but it's actually the alignment. Because the cornea, reflection from your cornea, you know, the, the very tiny pupil uh, that you have, about two to three millimeters. So all that alignment becomes very, very challenging. And typically this has been solved, as I said, by just making sure the eyepiece is well aligned uh, with the instrument. So we turned the problem around uh, in our most recent paper, and we actually created visual cues inside this device. And we call it eye selfie, because in, an, in a selfie, you know the picture is being taken because you can see yourself. So instead of creating a camera that you become an expert in aligning and taking a picture uh, without a feedback, a simple user feedback you know, solves that problem. So in case of eye selfie, it's not just a, a 2D image, but it's actually a 4D image, uh, a light field image. And as long as you're aligned, if you, can see the, if you can see the aligned pattern, the camera can see you. And using this mechanism, we're able to see uh, the back of the eye. So taking these ideas of you know, simplifying uh, interfaces, uh, I and my team had dozens of ideas. How can we solve you know, solutions for the blind, solutions for the visually challenged, uh, you know, even superhuman vision. Uh, but then I realized you know, if we do this one project at a time you know, through masters and PhD students, it could take us 15, 20 years to get all those ideas out. Um, can we do something about that? Uh, so this is my lab uh, at MIT. You know, everybody has a 3D printer, a, a lot of resources. You know, everybody's enjoying. But you know, the next five billion people we may want to target, fortunately or unfortunately, are not in, in Boston, are not near where you live. Um, and so to solve that, uh, we need to go out there and, and understand what these what this challenges are. Uh, we, can we learn from those communities? and can we solve problems that we are not even thinking about. Uh, so we launched an initiative called RedX, Rethinking Engineering Design and Execution. Um, and our idea is to engage uh, local innovators in finding the right problems to work on and don't, not solve them uh, in our labs, but treat the whole world uh, as our lab. So in this particular case, we wanted to target uh, solutions for the bind, for visually challenged, um, and, and creating superhuman vision. So let me show you a quick video. Are you connected?
And so this is not a competition or a hackathon uh, or some kind of a outreach uh, program. This is highly curated exploration and research uh, through classes I teach, uh, through collaborators we have. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about what are some interesting problems to work on. Uh, we uh, engage uh, innovators all over the world, find out what are the right uh, parameters to right constraints uh, we need to handle. We learn a lot from the challenges over there, and then we work together uh, to solve it. And so then we started moving uh, beyond just the eye conditions and started looking at uh, oral health um, or looking at uh, sleep disorders, which is a huge challenge uh, worldwide, um, or new interfaces for uh, looking at ear infections um, or also hearing tests. Now, these are all built with technologies that we use all the time, you know, electronics, computer vision, machine learning, signal processing, uh, and all kinds of interface ideas. But we are able to repurpose that uh, in unique ways. Now, what's interesting when it comes to health today is that, you know, over time, we made the doctors really experts. And they take, you know, they go to medical school, uh, they get a lot of training, uh, and then we realized there's a limit to what a doctor can do. So we started making the instruments smarter, uh, and they are amazing. But I would say the most underutilized resource in a healthcare setting is the patient himself or herself. And if we, as subjects, can use really complex technologies, why are we being treated like vegetables when we go and get health solutions? I think there's something we can do if we as subjects are actually given a smart interface. So by using this one simple idea of empowering the end user, we can come up with a whole bunch of solutions uh, going forward. And as somebody has, has told us, you know, as good as AI is, IA can beat AI. Intelligence amplification can beat artificial intelligence. And we can use that in, in so many ways. And using this philosophy, um, in our group, we have built a whole range of solutions, you know, new stethoscopes, new otoscopes, uh, new ways to measure infections, uh, new ways to look at oral health, um, uh, new types of uh, ECG and uh, EMG solutions, all using this basic premise that we can empower uh, the end user. Now, when I talk about emerging worlds, um, let's make sure we're talking about the right things. I think some time ago, uh, emerging worlds meant developing countries. Uh, but we, we, mean, we mean something more than that. Um, I think some time ago, uh, our efforts were about how can we save lives, you know, how can we distribute vaccines, how can we distribute mosquito nets. Uh, and then over the last 10 or 15 years, the conversation changed and, and uh, especially companies started thinking about how can we exploit emerging worlds as emerging markets. But now we're in a very unique world where with billions of new digital citizens, we can truly co-innovate with partners on the ground. And this is really a new model for us. So what are some things we are doing in, in our group to tackle these this, this large problems that could be solved through technology and technical interfaces. Uh, how about a CAT scan machine that can fit in a rickshaw? Now, as I said, there are two billion people who need uh, prescription glasses but don't wear them. How can we modify our screens so that your prescription can be dialed in into your displays. So the rest of the world will still look blurred if you take out your prescription and, and put it on your screen, but the screen itself would sh look sharp. Um, and then any commu community setting, schools, and, and shared interfaces would allow us to display a high quality information. And the basic idea behind that is to again convert a 2D display into a light-filled display 
you may have heard about effectively using kind of a unsharp masking on 2D images so that even with prescription, uh, even with blur, uh, you would pre-correct the 2D image. It turns out because of the nulls uh, in the spatial frequencies, you will not be able to invert. It will be an ill-conditioned problem. Uh, but in 4D ray space, that inversion is actually very stable. So pre-correcting the light field and displaying it uh, for a, a individual with, with uh, blurred vision is actually possible. And once you create a light field display on the screen, which has to be sufficiently high resolution, uh, you can dial in your prescription. So the same display can be used for folks with, with varying, uh, uh, with, with different uh, individual prescription. Now, how about reading a book without opening it page by page? In, in emerging worlds, in ancient worlds, there is a lot of archives, beautiful information that's hidden away from us because we simply cannot open the scrolls or the books or the artifacts. How would we do that? Using a different electromagnetic spectrum, in this case uh, using terahertz. Um, and terahertz are roughly 300 microns to a millimeter in wavelength, uh, but the pages of a book are about 20 micrometer thick. So, you know, a huge discrepancy between the wavelength and, and the thickness of the pages. Uh, so we're able to create new techniques in a lab that allow us to uh, see the images. I mean, the paper, the ink, and the air is uh, nearly transparent uh, in terahertz. At the same time, the refractive index changes between the paper and the ink is what allows us to get the Fresnel reflections. Uh, off of these pages. But that difference is only about 4%. Um, so we can, we can start looking at, at these uh, different text dif on different pages and also deal with occlusions uh, as we are looking at it from, from above. So here we have nine pages with text on it. We're going to use a terahertz sensor to do uh, interferometric measurements and, and compute raw data, the hypercube. Um, and then we're going to reshape uh, this hypercube and, and start looking at the signals. Now, terahertz are unique. They're not like light. The images are not just intensity images, but these are, these are fields, vector fields. Uh, and so you might actually get inversions at the paper-air interface. And through all that, um, you can see that we have uh, nine pages, uh, you can see uh, the reshaped hypercubes, and then we can start doing OCR um, and also take care of occlusions by building the physical model uh, for iterative removal of interfer inter interference uh, from top layers. Now, so far we can only look at about nine pages. We cannot read through a whole book because we had optimized the power, optimized the algorithms. But just imagine abilities to see through material that we simply cannot open. And we can take these ideas beyond imaging, beyond electromagnetic spectrum, also into electrical interfaces. Um, imagine uh, an interface that allows you to do an effortless identification, in this case, uh, through bioimpedance. So without a password, without uh, literacy to enter text, uh, and without very cumbersome uh, interfaces. Now, this is a demo uh, you'll see uh, in the evening uh, by Munehiko Sato, uh, Rohan Puri, uh, also in collaboration with uh, Ivan Pabro at, at Google. And then how can we go beyond that and create interfaces to locate people in hazardous conditions, or in certain cases, in some cases, to you know, allow you to connect, use connect uh, through walls? In this case, we can use radio frequencies, and uh, Ivan's uh, um, so, um, RF project, some of you may have seen. But you can also use RF at other frequencies. Um, our collaborators at MIT, Dina Katabi, and uh, also friends at UW have been playing with RF uh, for quite some time. And now we can use radio frequencies and effectively create a camera, a microwave camera, that can create 3D time of flight images. So here we have um, a mannequin uh, behind a, a, a wall. 
uh, and he can, here you can see time of flight images uh, with picosecond resolution. And we hope this will lead to new interfaces, but also lead to uh, new opportunities in, in emerging worlds. Uh, and then we have another demo uh, that Hisham Bedri and others are showing uh, in the evening uh, of using radio frequency signals for through wall uh, interfaces. What are some other challenges uh, in emerging worlds? Can you locate, can you detect cancer by detecting circling tumor cell through your body? Uh, and one of the methods to use that is through fluorescence uh, lifetime imaging. But can we create a physical interface that looks much like a, a blood pressure cuff and, and measure the fluorescence lifetime of, uh, of tagged cells, fluorophore, fluorophore tagged cells? Um, and as you know, a benign tumor versus a malignant tumor will change the lifetime of the tagged fluorophore. And can we measure that? Or can we create completely new interfaces for oral health that use your toothbrush as an input device, as a sensing device? Now, as I said earlier, we live in a, a, a world where uh, we get digital services from companies who don't own uh, any of the physical assets. <clears throat> and moving forward, uh, you know, we will get health solutions without hospitals. Uh, we will learn without schools. Uh, we will grow food uh, without depending on farms, indoor farming, uh, and we'll transact in yet unknown currencies, no physical currencies. So the digital opportunities for physical systems are huge. The way it has been solved um, by, by large organizations um, in the rich world was let's develop the technology here and throw it over the wall in the emerging world and see if it works. And that didn't go very far. And so some of them started saying, hey, let's open labs and let's send expats to Sao Paulo and Bangalore and Beijing uh, to see maybe by embedding researchers, uh, we will be able to understand and innovate. Uh, in interesting ways. And uh, Kentaro Toyama, in his beautiful book, uh, Geek Herse, um, describes this problem of law of amplification, where technology, in most cases, simply amplifies what's already on the ground. If things are getting better, they will get better faster. But if things are, are, are not getting well, the technology on its own is not going to change it. So we need a third model which I call together model, which is thinking about to solve these digital problems for physical systems. How can we work together and work with hundreds and hundreds of innovators, inventors, practitioners together? Now, this is very, very complex. And as the computing community, uh, also seems very daunting for us of how we would achieve. So recently, uh, we took a, a huge leap uh, and said, uh, let's try to look at not just health solutions and certain imaging solutions, but look at a collection of problems that, that um, we can target in an integrated place. And that's Kumbh Mela. Uh, Kumbh Mela is 30 million people show up for 30 days uh, for pilgrimage. Has anybody heard of Kumbh Mela here? Yeah, so you know, you, you know about Hajj, but it's like Hajj times 20, okay? And the complexity is mind-blowing. And it's a really beautiful, very colorful festival.
very colorful, very beautiful, very safe. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll get to experience it uh, yourself. Um, and, um, you know, over the years, you know, the, the festival has been going on for, we don't even know, thousands of years. Um, and there are always challenges, and they have been usually tackled through a lot of police and paramedics and a huge top-down infrastructure. I think we have opportunities to do something interesting when it comes to challenges uh, in food and health and housing and transactions uh, and so on. So over the last two years, um, our team uh, at MIT, in, in collaboration with you know, a lot of large uh, companies and, and foundations, uh, have been making trips once roughly three months uh, to look at what are some interesting opportunities, uh, digital opportunities, uh, to tackle these challenges in coordination with the local government, uh, local universities, and local businesses. Uh, and so we have looked at, uh, you know, sensing technologies to count the crowd. Uh, we're looking at food distribution, food logistics, uh, various ways to steer the crowds using cell phone tower data, um, new way of uh, building housing, pop-up housing, uh, food distribution that reaches networks, reaches places cannot reach. Um, and it has been just fascinating. I encourage you to go to our website to see all the efforts that have gone in. And anyone is, everyone is welcome to uh, participate. And the next camp uh, is in just about a couple of months um, in very close to Bombay, end of January. So if anybody wants to come and see new opportunities for digital interfaces. So when it comes to you know, big data or Internet of Things, newly digital citizens, it's obvious that we cannot think linearly and scale the solutions that we already know. We have to leapfrog and think about solutions that are well beyond, that are out of sight, and that's why they're out of our, our mind. Uh, so with some of the collaborators uh, at Media Lab, uh, we have started, as I said, this RedX uh, initiative, um, and we have centers popping up uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, you may know some of these people, Sandy Pentland, uh, Kent Larson, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, Cesar Hidalgo, and uh, Ria Dabelt. Um, and also we have Professor Ishi here uh, from Media Lab who constantly inspires me to do new things. And as we approach you know, the 30th um, anniversary of West in, in a couple of years, I think we have a, a, a very interesting uh, milestone here. Um, if you believe uh, the hype out there, um, you know, the number of users coming online, the number of users using uh, new digital solutions is mushrooming. Uh, you know, in, 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 uh, we have about 30 million users every, every month coming online who were not online before. So I hope that although we have made great progress in personal productivity or entertainment or organization, uh, digital interfaces to organizations uh, at West, over the next 30 years, uh, we will also look at uh, digital interfaces to health, wealth, and well-being. And you know, being a faculty, um, you know, it was always about publish or perish. And then we heard, then, you know, it became easy enough to, and the reason why it was publish or perish is because the only way to get your ideas out was through publishing. Um, you submit your paper, your paper gets presented, and over the next five to 10 years, somebody else will build on top of it, pick up your idea, and, and bring it in the real world. And then that paradigm changed, and we started saying demo or die. Uh, because we realized, actually, it's, it's easy enough to prototype. We can actually build things and show it, not just write a paper about it. And so I'm delighted with the demo session. I think there are about 30 plus uh, amazing demos. But let's go one step beyond that. The same way about a few years ago, it became easy to demo live. Uh, it has become easier and easier to deploy uh, through hardware technologies, through software platforms, through cloud architectures, 
through worldwide networks. And I hope over the next 30 years, we will have deploy sessions uh, also uh, at West. Uh, by the way, the new mantra at MIT Media Lab is deploy or doom. Okay, how many of you remember this fantastic use of pencils? <laughs> you know, and this is the most useful application of pencil as an interface to music. Um, and so we never know, you know, the things you build in this community can go out there as an interface and how the interfaces will be used out there. Now, uh, we took a picture of this woman uh, outside Hyderabad uh, in, in India, um, and she has converted a technology, which is a weighing scale, into her business, right? Uh, but she's very proud of that. I mean, look at the entrance to her, to her business. You know, she has a mat. She's very proud of it. So we never know through this micro-entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs how solutions and technologies and interface solutions we build in this community will have an impact out there in the world. And we have to keep trying. So to conclude, I think the world is our lab. There are billions of newly digital citizens that are hungry for new interfaces to physical solutions. There are industries and organizations that need completely new approaches in the emerging worlds by co-innovating with partners on the ground. There are dozens and dozens of completely new research directions, and of course, hundreds of new thesis topics. The world is our lab, so let's solve the billion dollar problems that will touch a billion lives. Thank you. Five seconds, there we go. So, thank you very much for your keynote. Um, so, I think now is a very good time to do the bio that I missed, unfortunately, for having <laughs> to step out. Um, so, I've known you now for 15 years since we worked at Merle, and there's actually a number of your former colleagues here as well. Um, and it's a very, your, yours is a very interesting career to watch, you know, taking uh, projected augmented reality work that you did early on and then all through computational imaging and then looking at going global, you know, going out and deploying. And you're one of the TR100 young innovators. Uh, you're one of the 20 Indian tech innovators that was awarded the first Indus Tech Innovator. You know, you have your Sloan Research Fellowship, DARPA Young Faculty, Launch Health Innovation. You've got 50 patents. Um, and I think it's the trajectory that you've actually had that is the reason uh, you, were, you were invited here today. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, ask the audience to see if they have questions for you. Um, there's a microphone over here. There's a microphone over oop, there. Um, however, if you just want to stay where you are, um, and we're just going to send the microphones roving around to you. So please just put up your hand if you have a question for Ramesh, um, and we'll get the microphones brought to you. Um, is maybe the easiest way to do it. We know we like queuing, but let's actually just go for questions in the audience. So put up your hand if you have a question. Okay, there we go, Dan. Hi, uh, Daniel Wigdor from the University of Toronto, formerly an intern outside your office at Merle. <laughs> um, so I, I, I love the, the, the call to action that we actually start doing deployments and bust out of the demos, but I worry about cost. And I would love to have your thoughts on that, not just on the cost of production, but also on the cost of maintenance and, and especially the cost of when we leave the technologies behind and we move on to the next project, how do we enable people to continue to use them and to build on them and to really incorporate them into the, to their lives? 
Yeah, very true. I mean, cost is just one aspect of, of deploy, but there are many other aspects. There's technology risk, there's adoption risk, um, there is uh, accept, you know, acceptance of, of your solution. Um, but as I said, I think a uh, lot of those challenges are diminishing very, very quickly. And deploy doesn't mean it's, you know, it has raised millions of dollars on Kickstarter or, you know, is being used by, you know, USAID or, you know, somebody has picked it up and has it in thousands of units. It could be deployed with just five units or ten units. Um, you know, if it's a software solution, it's being used by 100 people. That's good enough. And, um, you know, as much as we believe in, uh, in user studies and user feedback uh, in constraint setting, I think now we have ability to do that in the wild. Um, and that's what I mean by deploy. So the deploy doesn't mean just millions of units. It could be five, ten, hundred to start with. Uh, and the cost, uh, you know, that should be part of uh, our community. When we, when, we talk about, when we talk about research, uh, we shouldn't be just writing grant proposals for, for funding salaries, but it should be, you know, part of the plan that we're going to deploy five or ten or hundred of these. Hi, thank you for the talk, Ramesh. Um, I was curious a bit, uh, you brought up Ken, oh, is this all right? Uh, Kentaro Toyama's book, um, and, and then you talked about the Kumela Festival, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, and you mentioned that a lot of the infrastructure at Kumela is done via centralized um, authorities, and sort of in, in the vein of uh, Kentaro's book, it seems like a lot of the infrastructure services you're looking at, tracking people through sensors, um, having these uh, distribution networks for food or for um, health services seem very centralized as well. Um, I wonder if you've thought about that at all, because it seems very much in the vein of that, that it's not really the technology is just amplifying that existing structure. Yeah, very true, and it's a great book. I encourage you to read it. Um, I think what's changing, and I think Intero made a good point of the, you know, here, I mean, in my words, here, there, and together. I think in our case, um, you know, we have the government officials in real time with us. You know, I'm on the phone with the police commissioner, you know, while I'm there. My team is on the phone with the police commissioner, you know, with the health officials, uh, and so on. So it's a real time. Uh, interaction. And also, uh, the initial, um, you know, it's a very complex uh, event with 30 million people. Uh, so there's only so much we can do. Uh, so we have to be careful about where exactly we intervene. Um, so for example, for crowd steering, we had about six locations that tracked about a million people crossing the, crossing the foot mats. Uh, and that created real-time data for prediction of in which part of the, um, the ghats, as they call it, near the rivers. Uh, would have you know, more, uh, more people coming, so they could predict that. But we also used uh, a completely new solution uh, where we can see crowds on a desktop, on a dashboard, moving through the cities. And that was done through cell phone tower data. Uh, so the cell phone towers, as you know, will give you the count of subscribers, and after de-identification, we can still use the aggregate data to map the density of the crowds. And so we were able to convince uh, the city officials to give this data to us in real time. As far as I know, it has never been done anywhere in the world. Um, and so we're able to use uh, this, this, this crowd mapping and provide that information back to the population, uh, but more importantly, provide it back to the control rooms uh, to see where they're going. So you have to be very careful about where it goes. I should, I should be very um, uh, you know, clear saying that this is just a beginning. Uh, it hasn't had a huge impact uh, because just the beginning. Uh, but I think there are ways to interface in this uh, events like Umumela, uh and actually use a lot of our research ideas uh, to go out there. So I'm going to ask the question that I was burning to ask. Um, so I got to spend time recently with the former CEO of Foxconn and he's now working in, in the hacking of the supp electronic supply chain in um, Shenzhen in China. And the, quest the answer he gives to many questions about 
this kind of stuff is can the system been built that we already have, can it be broken apart? Can it be actually hacked? And where can it be hacked? So can the healthcare systems in these countries actually be hacked? Um, people would always say to him that you can't hack that, you can't hack that. And his answer to every single question like that was, that's what Nokia used to say. So when people would say like, oh no, we're, you can't change the business, you can't change, you know, people will always be using it the way they've always used it. And he said that's exactly what Nokia used to say to him as they were declining as his main um, customer. So this is the thing, these are very carefully constructed human systems for healthcare. Um, and you're going in and you're actually kind of empowering the patient in a kind of a bottom-up way. To me, it just looks like hacking the healthcare system, basically, empowering the individual. Um, these are two kind of very conflicting worldviews. Is it, is it a safe thing to hack that healthcare system? <laughs> yeah, I should be careful about using the word hack when it comes to, <laughs> comes to patients. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I think the transformation is already going on. Uh, many of us use, you know, health and well-being solutions that were unimaginable, you know, even five years ago. Uh, it's kind of impressive. If you, if you look at the story of uh, how uh, diabetics started using uh, insulin pumps, it took a long time for the transformation to happen to empower individual uh, to use, uh, you know, to inject insulin themselves, you know. Um, and same thing with blood pressure cuffs. It took a long time uh, for FDA to allow individuals to measure their own blood pressure through automated devices. Um, and, but those are, you know, so examples from, from some time ago. But now I think we're very quickly moving into a regime uh, where um, the data is very important. Um, and so the incentives for measuring data even from healthy individuals is, is very, very high. Uh, so we're slowly shifting from healthcare to health and from health to wellness. Um, and this is a very interesting trend for us in the computing community, uh, in the interface community, because we can learn a lot by looking at the longitudinal data. Uh, so, you know, today's health solutions or healthcare solutions are infrequent measurements that are extremely high quality. Uh, but now we are moving into a world where we have very frequent measurements, but they may be very low quality. All you may have is your heart rate and your skin conductance and your weight. And, and, and you know, your mental state and so on. But this low quality, but more frequent uh, data streams can actually be very, very powerful. So I think hacking can come at various levels. It can come by hacking physical hardware, um, but it can also come through this, this uh, you know, data streams uh, that can be exploited uh, in very unique ways. It also goes back to, you know, we hear about makers or DIY uh, or fabbing. Um, and I think, you know, those are all fantastic movements. But instead of DIY, do it yourself, why not do it for others? Or instead of makers that make for their own enjoyment, why not make for others? Uh, and those movements require very different ecosystems. I mean, I see Eric sitting here, uh, you know, has a lot of experience in this field. Um, and, and, you know, so let's move away from the hacking culture that's for fun and entertainment and, and personal satisfaction and move towards a more systemic, more systematic uh, approach that becomes embedded in this formal community of researchers. <clears throat> so unless we have no final questions, Oh, yeah, oh, we got to. There we go. Of course, there we go. Two final questions. Ramesh, thank you so much for that talk. It's great. Um, my question isn't really specifically about anything in your talk, but just you've got this amazing trajectory in your career, as Aaron was saying. Um, and there's a lot of young PhD students here in the room. I'm wondering if you have advice for them as they make their way through this um, and, and enter this sort of career path. What would you tell them? That's funny because I had a slide for that. <laughs> That's how professors do. So I think we're going through um, a, a very disruptive transformation of a classic PhD. Um, as you can see, to have a real world impact, it's not just about publish or demo. It's going to be more and more about deploy. Um, and to do that, we need to work in teams with very rapid iterations. But you know, a master's or PhD has traditionally been a solo effort that's multi-year. And that's 
it's very, very challenging. I think by the time you graduate, the stuff that you thought is interesting to work on may have either changed or some parallel technologies, parallel ecosystems have made that obsolete. And the way we really need to work is through teams and very swift iterations. So, you know, the same way the value of publication is going down nowadays because people like to watch videos, uh, they like to watch even research videos. Uh, I think we have this very disruptive change that's coming up uh, in, in PhD careers as well. I would be very surprised if a few years down the line uh, a PhD student will be judged based on their thesis. I think they'll be judged more on whether you're able to demo and deploy. Uh, and whether you're able to work in teams and did you create not one solution, but series of solutions that support your fundamental thesis, your fundamental argument. Um, so I think it's going to be you know, very challenging going forward as a, as a, as a traditional PhD student. Um, and so my, my, I don't know if it's an advice because it's always, you know, has a survivor bias uh, built into it and, and a lot of attribute. But um, I would say work in teams, be out there. Don't do here or there, do it together. Hi, thanks again. Um, you said that effective partnerships are critical. How do we form effective partnerships? Where is the, where is the person asking the question? Okay. Um, so, so the partnerships are, are very time consuming because you know, by the time you build the chemistry, by the time you identify the right problems and solutions, uh, and that's why we started this whole RedX platform, um, Rethinking Engineering Design and, and Execution, uh, where these this, uh, communities, emerging communities, uh, and they're not necessarily in developing countries, they could be in any emerging areas, um, are, are already anxious to find uh, these problems, uh, to s solve these problems. Um, and so we have been very fortunate to have constant connections with this, and it takes a lot of time. It's take two, three, four years before we actually have a, a, a kind of a Redux uh, initiative that's uh, up and running. Uh, but you know, going back to uh, your question, um, uh, I think we need those avenues, um, not just our universities and labs, uh, but you know, uh, labs all over the world, or the world itself as a lab, uh, so that we can go forward. So. You know, all the Redex centers that we have in partnerships are open to any one of you. You know, it's not restricted to, to you know, uh, people that I work with, work closely with. And that's the only way it's going to, going to go forward. So I agree with you, partnerships are challenging, uh, but I think that's going to be the new model. Those are the new places for doing research and deployment. Okay, I think we better wrap it up now. Um, so I think as a, an individual researcher, but as members of communities, uh, beyond just here. Uh, I think the thing I'll take away is, as a PhD student, I did worry about publish or perish. And now, about trying to get visibility, it, it does seem to be demo or die. Uh, but I think the, the, the take-home message I'll have is possibly deploy or disappear <laughs> as a research community, because as competition moves into the fabric of life, will become less um, today's news, will be tomorrow's um, old, old newspapers. So if we don't, um, possibly we could disappear and uh, into the fabric along with everybody else. So I just want to thank you very much on behalf of everyone here again for coming for your keynote. And uh, we're going to go to a break session now. So thank you very much for Thank much. you.